On June 3, 1879, the Sacramento Daily Union reported that the Pauline Markham Troop had passed through Omaha the previous day en route to California and were scheduled to arrive in Sacramento on June 6. The Markham Troop had recently finished a run of HMS Pinafore at Hooley's Theater in Chicago. The Chicago Tribune noted that the troop was headed to San Francisco. About the only spot on this continent where the people have been free from Pinafore so far. The Trib could not have been more wrong. HMS Pinafore premiered at London's Opera Comique on May 25, 1878, the fourth collaboration between playwright William S. Gilbert and composer Arthur S. Sullivan, under the watchful eye of producer Richard Doyley Cart. Originally playing to middling audiences, Pinafore soon took London by storm running for 571 performances. American producers took notice of this success. Pinafore mania soon swept over America like a plague. But when the breezes blow, I generally go below and seek the seclusion that the cabin grants. The first American pinafore sailed into the Boston Museum on November 25, 1878. Conducted by John Joseph Bram, the production featured George Wilson as Sir Joseph Porter, KCB. Marie Wainwright as Josephine, and a cross-dressing Rose Temple as the tenor romantic lead, Rafe Rackstraw. Although reviews were favorable, most took exception to casting Miss Temple as Rafe, with the Boston Herald commenting, The mistake of giving the character to female performance was evident throughout, and some of the best musical combinations were brought to naught thereby. You're very, very good, and be it understood, I command the right good crew. While the Boston Daily Advertiser observed, It is especially unfortunate that for the part of the hero Rafe, a strong and capable tenor has not been found. The Boston Evening Journal, while praising other members of the cast, simply omits mention of Miss Temple's Rafe. Joseph Hayworth, a native of Cleveland, Ohio, played the bosun. His hometown newspaper, The Plain Dealer, took prideful note of his performance. Joe Hayworth seems to have made a decided hit in the comic opera HMS Pinafore, produced at the Boston Museum. His acting is well spoken of, and his singing is said to be the feature of the performance. The production closed on Saturday, January 18th, after 61 performances. The company immediately took it on a tour of 15 New England cities. Propelled by the Transcontinental Railway and the Telegraph, HMS Pinafore spread faster than any biological pathogen. Barely a month after the Boston premiere, the Alice Oates English Comic Opera Company presented Pinafore in San Francisco at the Bush Street Theater on December 23rd. When Pauline Markham's Pinafore Troop docked in San Francisco in June 1879, there were no fewer than three pinafores sailing smoothly along at San Francisco theaters. Charles Locke's Bush Street Theater harbored a production featuring a charming chorus of 50 voices with Miss Annie Ainsworth as Josephine while Emily Melville's pinafore scudded before the breeze at the Standard Theater, featuring many of the most prominent musical artists of this city and Oakland, with a 75-voice chorus and an 18-piece orchestra. 
and Amy Sherwin, the Tasmanian Nightingale, took the helm as Josephine at the Grand Opera House. In short, when Pauline Markham arrived in the city, San Francisco was hardly the only spot on this continent where the people have been free from pinafore so far. The same day the Alice Oates pinafore made landfall in San Francisco, John T. Ford piloted pinafore up Chesapeake Bay to Baltimore, opening at Ford's Grand Opera House on December 23rd. This production featured Blanche Chapman, a cousin of John Wilkes Booth and daughter-in-law of proprietor Ford, as Josephine. In 1879, Ford portaged his pinafore overland to Philadelphia, reaching harbor at the Broad Street Theater the week of January 6th. His daughter-in-law, Blanche Chapman, again portrayed Josephine. First Cousin Hebe was played by Miss Belle McKenzie. Henry Ward Beecher, the famed abolitionist, enjoyed a performance of this production on February 3rd. On February 14th, producer Ford hoisted sail for the state capital, Harrisburg, docking at the Grand Opera House. Proprietor Ford's success inspired other managers. A second pinafore docked at Philadelphia's North Broad Street Theater on February 10th. This production featured Miss Annie Pixley as Josephine. A third pinafore anchored at the Arch Street Theater on February 17th. The Philadelphia Inquirer noted that this production was not altogether satisfactory. In 1879, New York's theatrical dominance was still years in the future, and the city had to wait until January 1879, two months after the Boston premiere, to chortle over Gilbert's wit and hum Sullivan's irresistible tunes. On January 15th, the New York Herald respectfully announced HMS Pinafore will receive its first introduction to a New York audience, with a completeness in all its detail worthy of its celebrated author and composer. Opening at the Standard Theater, this production almost foundered, the Herald noting that the performance was far from perfect. The most unpardonable defect was not knowing their lines. The rehearsal should proceed until this glaring defect is remedied. This glaring defect was remedied, and by February 2nd, the Herald reported, The piece is now running smoothly, and nightly elicits roars of laughter and applause. The character of the First Lord of the Admiralty, as personated by Mr. Thomas Whiffen, is a clever bit of acting and thoroughly enjoyable. Mr. William Davidge as Dick Deadeye. Mr. Eugene Clark as Captain Corcoran. Miss Eva Mills as Josephine, the Captain's daughter. Miss Blanche Galton as the Bum Boat Woman. And Mademoiselle Jarbeau as the Admiral's first cousin are likewise excellent in their respective parts. The tenor, Mr. Henry Laurent, however, is not equal to the personation of his character of Rafe Rackstraw, the able seaman. His voice is thin where it should be robust and cold where it should be sympathetic. This was the first trickle of what would soon become a torrent of bad notices for poor Rafes, with one wag remarking, Pinafore is degenerating. Its Rafes are winning to themselves the sobriquet of Sing Bad the Sailor. Inspired by Pinafore's electric success at the Standard, Rice's Opera Bouffe Extravaganza Company 
sailed into the Lyceum on Thursday, January 23rd. Like the Boston Museum's American premiere, this production featured a woman, Lizzie Webster, as Wraith. And did one better, or worse, by casting George Fortescue as Little Buttercup. Weighing in at 300 pounds, Mr. Fortescue specialized in transvestite roles. Mercifully, this production closed in one week on Saturday, February 1st, only to move across the East River to Brooklyn's Park Theater. This did not leave the Lyceum empty, with New York's third pinafore opening there on Monday, February 3rd. This production again featured a woman, Miss Sanger, as Rafe. Reviews were not kind. As the company was not formed until Saturday, it was not surprising to find nearly all the characters singing woefully out of time and tune. The new Pinafore Opera Company sailed with the tide into the Fifth Avenue Theater on February 10th, with Henry Laurent reprising his role as Rafe. As one observer noted, Almost any old operatic tub with HMS Pinafore on her stern seems good enough to attract paying passengers, and a roaring chorus and a roaring business are convertible terms. By the end of the 1879 season, every major New York theater had mounted at least one production of HMS Pinafore. In uttering a reprobation to any British tar, I tried to speak with moderation, but you have gone too far. And theatrical managers advertised in the newspapers, Wanted, principals, also male and female chorus for Pinafore. While an armada of pinafores besieged New York, the Boston Museum pinafore continued to patrol New England waters and was joined by, among others, Ada Richmond's English opera troupe. My pain and my distress, I find it is not easy to express. After a six-week absence, HMS Pinafore returned to Boston on Monday, March 3rd, where three productions opened simultaneously. The Boston Herald reviewed all three under the headline, The Fleet of Pinafores. Not a few attempted to do all three of these shows during the evening. Only a few days after Ada Richmond's company had left the Gaiety, another pinafore sailed in that same theater from New York on March 17th. Is wholly indefensible. Go, Ribble, get you New York's Fifth Avenue Opera Company with the much maligned Henry Laurent at the helm as Rafe, and including Blanche Corelli as Josephine, and George Frothingham as Dick Deadeye. On Monday, April 14th, the Boston Theater presented the ideal pinafore, featuring Boston favorites and lyric celebrities, among them, Henry Clay Barnaby as Sir Joseph, Mary Beebe as Josephine, and Georgia K. Van as Hebe. The production was so successful that other comic operas were quickly mounted, and the troupe became a de facto repertory company, the Ideal Opera Company, later known as the Bostonians. With the Bostonians, Barnaby encouraged many American composers to try their hands at creating operettas, including Victor Herbert. I am the monarch of the sea, and when I've married thee... Meanwhile, as the Boston Museum's original pinafore was nearing the end of its run, Pauline Markham was playing at the Howard Athenaeum in Chilperic. In just a few weeks, she would be taking Pinafore into America's hinterland. <laughs> 